Okay, ready? Here we go for our last part of the class tonight. Okay. All right, so we have this momentous moment when Saul is turned in chapter 9. And um, Saul is changed from an enemy of the church into the most fearsome uh, proponent of the church. And we're going to talk more about him next uh, the, fo- the week after the play because we're going to talk about his epistles and we'll do a whole little study on the life of Paul and some of his major teachings. But we're, we're back to Peter here and we, we see Peter before the thing transitions. Peter is at the center of a, a major shift in the, um, in the focus of the church, really. Because uh, Peter is, you know, there's power happening. At the end of chapter 9, Peter heals a man and then resurrects a woman, you know, in the power of Jesus Christ. And so um, this happens. And then in in the next chapter, Peter is relaxing on top of his house, and then God gives him a mission, a great giant widescreen thing comes down out of the sky like a curtain and it all kinds of unclean animals are there probably a little piggy maybe a crab you know and God says I like to think crabs I think you know I'm glad that I'm allowed to eat crabs and shrimp and stuff like that tasty tasty little creatures they are um anyway but Pete and bacon how can you reject bacon if you're a man sorry it's just the way it is I mean you can I guess sometimes if you got cholesterol issues you should but, you know, anyway, but Peter gets this idea, rise, kill, and eat. And he says, not so, Lord. That's really awesome. What a job. What a, not so. Hey, you know, God says from heaven, okay, go ahead and eat. And Peter says, no way. You know, it's like really kind of, you know, it's kind of, and somebody said, you could say, Lord, you can say not so, but it's really a problem if you say not so, Lord. It's like, that's like, but this is, you know, this is the, this is like, this was what makes uh, the God of the Bible a lot different from other gods. You know, the God of the Bible is really, um, you know, not insecure about who he is. And so he just kindly prods Peter into obedience. And what happens is uh, a man, Cornelius, a soldier, has gotten a dream from God, a vision from God, and God has told him to send for Peter to get the message of the gospel. Peter goes. And uh, what happens in the midst of his message, the Holy Spirit falls on the people there, the Gentiles. And uh, Jesus said, I mean, uh, Peter says, what's going, you know, the Holy Spirit has fallen on these people just as it did upon us in the upper room. And so we have to baptize these people. These people are believers in Christ. And this creates a tension. It's kind of interesting. You'll notice this as you grow up. Some of you, some of you are already grown up, I'm sorry. But if you've, if you're grown up, you've noticed this. If you are growing up, you've no, you'll notice this, that some people make things happen. Now, Peter was a person who made things happen and uh, God helped him go to this and it happened. Some people hear about things that happen. Like what, where were you, Peter? Why did you go to this person's house? It's like, it's not legal. You know, you are a Jew, you don't belong in that place, you weren't supposed to go there. And some people actually oppose that. It's like, it's really wrong. You know, you know, Peter, you're in trouble. We're going to bring you up before the council right now, and we're going to ask you why you went to a Gentile house to talk to them about the things of Jesus. And then other people, uh, this is where we see like the, the, the original ministry of Barnabas, all right, at the end of this chapter 11. And what's going to happen now is like because of the atmosphere in Jerusalem and the unbelief in Jerusalem, the church is going to start, the church's center of operation is going to shift to this place in Syria called Antioch. It's up north, it's farther. The, uh, the ministry is, uh, is more effective there. People are receiving the gospel. It's away from the religious center that's of unbelief that's happening in Jerusalem. So some people hear what happened to Peter and they're upset about it. Peter says, this is what happened. I'm just going to tell you. You know, I, I really didn't want to eat the stuff. I didn't want to do the unclean thing. But God made me. 
The Holy Spirit led me. And then when I preached the message, the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. So, and then, you know, the Jerusalem Council had to agree. This was, they had to agree that um, God has granted the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. And that's the, you know, they were silenced by this. They were silenced by Peter's testimony. And so Antioch now be Barnabas, and what he does in Antioch is a, Barnabas will go and find Paul, who has gone back to his hometown of Tarshish, and bring him to Antioch. And this has been like some years now. Like Paul saw Jesus in Damascus. He had to escape because they were trying to kill him. And then there's a space of maybe 15, 14, 15 years where Paul is, you know, is, is communing with God, receiving things of God. He's serving God. We don't know a whole lot about him, but it, there's a space of about 15 years before he returns to his hometown of Tarshish and then Barnabas goes and gets him and brings him to Antioch and he begins teaching in Antioch and becomes called out as a missionary to take the gospel to many places. So the move to Antioch, it's a new center of operation. The church is established. It gets sanctioned by Jerusalem. Barnabas brings Paul back to Antioch and that's a big thing there. And there's a unity of church. There's a unity. The unity of the church there is to help the, the church at Jerusalem. So this is not a detachment. It's just that this is another, they're in unity, but this base of operations is going to be important now. Paul and several others will, it's like the first, um, it's like the first like real Bible college. Let's put it that way. You can call it that because, um, uh, let's see, there was, uh, let's see, um, where is it? There's a listing of these. There's a listing of, uh, of a bunch of people that were, that, that taught in Antioch. Um, there it is, in the beginning of chapter 13. In the church at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. So it's basically, you know, a Bible center. And they're teaching about this, you know. Simon, who was called Niger, Lucis of Cyrene, Manin, who had been brought up with Cyrene, and uh, Her and uh, Saul. So these are their primary teachers. And then the Holy Spirit said to this group of people, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So that's going to be the, you know. Uh, what's happening in Jerusalem at this time is uh, James has been killed, the brother of John. Peter has been put in prison. And, the, you know, the, there's, you know, the, you know, Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, the, the apostles aren't moving. The persecution is going to get them to move. You know, Peter's put in prison. He's delivered from prison. And now Paul is called. Paul and Barnabas are called to go on the missionary operation. So this is the birth of the missionary mindset. Chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. They got the teachers, but laid hands. They fasted, they prayed, laid hands on them, and... The church leaders at Antioch sent them away. Sent them away. So in Jerusalem, you had a group of guys that were really trying to hang together and maybe against the will of God, trying to hang together. So God forced them out with the persecution. And now in Antioch, they get the call. They don't make that. They don't make that. Um, they don't, they're not slow to answer. They are quick to answer what God says. And they sent by the Holy Spirit, and uh, Paul is sent, and immediately God confirms this by doing something amazing in Cyprus. And uh, someone is healed there, and uh, they arrive there, and they, you know, deliver, and they start to preach the gospel, and there's a message that happens there. They go to this other place in Pisidian Antioch. Paul has a sermon, and there's a reaction. Iconium to Lyconia, Lystra, Derby, all these things. And at all of these places, in all of these places, Paul's ministry takes root and churches are born there. Paul preaches the gospel and uh, Barnabas, they minister and things happen. We can see here's their first missionary journey. This is Antioch here. Where's my... The Antioch here. And they go to Cyprus. They have a ministry on Cyprus. They come up into this part of Asia, 
you know, moving around through these little towns and uh, back down to the seaport, and then they come back to Antioch. They were going to go, they did this uh, uh, three times, these kind of ever-expanding kind of missionary missions that happen here, led by Paul and Barnabas. Um, so as this ministry starts happening, a problem develops, okay? Just as you were talking here in this group, the law, the legalism, okay? People are getting saved all over the Roman Empire now. And the jealousy that was among the Pharisees as it related to the apostles and their ministry, now you have people who are connected with the apostles who are Jewish, and they have a legal mind, a legal heart, and they are, you know, again, this is, a, you know, Peter went uh, to the house of the Gentile. He was called on the carpet. And now people are listening and hearing reports of how uh, all kinds of people are becoming believers in Jesus without becoming Jewish first. And this is a problem for some people, and powerful people, apparently, because they get the council of Jerusalem, the elders led by James, the brother of Jesus, they get them together to have an argument about this. Why aren't we teaching people to be Jewish first, then believe in Jesus? It's like you thought that the Peter thing would have fixed that at the beginning, figuring that he was a primary apostle. You know, one of the big three, Peter, James, and John. You know, they spent more time with Jesus than anybody. Saw him in the Mount of Transfiguration. How come we can't believe what he said about the message? But a couple years later, a few years later, there's a great ministry. People are getting saved all over the place. This is a good thing. No, 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 no. They're not becoming Jewish enough. They're not becoming Jewish, then Jesus. Jewish, then Jesus, you know. And so this becomes an issue. So, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, Warren, I have a little comment in this this Bible by Warren Wearsby. It's a little comment. It says, when God opens a door, the enemy always has somebody handy to try to close it. And so the legalists started to visit different places, following Paul and saying, now, it's great that you know Jesus, but you got to be a little bit more legalistic. You got to follow the law. You got to eat these things. You got to get, if you're a guy, you know, you got to get circumcised, you know, and you know, what guy wants to get circumcised when he's like 40, 50, you know? I mean, it's just, you know, it's just, you know, what guy wants that to happen? You know, these are, in the, these, are in a, these are in a primitive medical era. You know, why, you know, just think about it, all right? Or don't, not for very long, I'm sorry. Don't think about it, actually. <laughs> uh, yes? Um, it talks, uh, Paul, had, Paul had three missionary journeys. Yes. Yeah. And, and all of the all three of his missionary journeys yes. are spoken and taken place in, in the book of Acts. Yes. Spoken about and they take yeah. place in the book of Acts. Three missionary journeys and then a and then a and then a trip that was as a result of his arrest and being carted off to Rome. That wasn't a that wasn't that was a that was a um, uh, a non volunteer missionary journey. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> the first two missionary journeys, the first three missionary journeys, he purposed and planned to, to do that. The, the fourth one that took him to Rome, that was, uh, that was not of his choosing. But he, you know, he witnessed in several places there and made many believers and led many people to, to Christ with that. Okay, so the legal minds present this, but there's finally this conclusion and the application. James listening James listens to all this. James apparently has now become like the chief elder in Jerusalem and the chief of the, uh, of the Christian movement. So if you're looking for like the home base, you know, it did start in Jerusalem and this is where they bring their theological problems to this group of people. So I don't know how many other apostles are there with him, but he's the brother of Jesus. He's leading this. He, he listens to the arguments and then he, um, you know, he uh, quiets this and he says, you know, uh, Simon has declared how God first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And it's written in the, in the Amos that I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David and I will set it up. The tabernacle of David is really like, like, like the Jewish believers were thinking about that now we're going to have a temple, but the temple is going to be different. 
it's going to be a Jesus temple, not the temple of the Pharisees. But, you know, but James, you know, very wisely says, you know, the tabernacle of David is, is not like the temple of Solomon or the temple of Herod. The tabernacle of David is having a heart after God. And so that's what God is going to establish. And so uh, they write this letter and say, it'd be good if you did this. If you don't eat, you know, I don't quite know what the issue is. I think it has something to do with um, things strangled. It has something to do with, you know, don't eat things strangled. It has something to do with pagan practices and the strangling of an animal as far as that. So you shouldn't do that because it's really like it's gross to watch them strangle the animal. And like, you know, that's not a good thing. Um, don't drink blood. You know, don't drink the blood of the animal. That's another pagan kind of practice. Don't eat. And that's, that brings its own kind of um, uh, diseases that could get into the human system. So these are very practical things. Abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, that's uh, pagan prostitution, from things strangled, that's another practice of idolatry, and from blood, drinking of blood, another practice of idolatry. Like all these people had religions that they were practicing, they're turning to Jesus. You don't have to enter into another religious system. But we understand that a part of those religious systems that you've been in involved sexuality, strangling animals in a ritual, and drinking blood in a ritual. You should avoid those things and you should just come to Christ. If you do these things, you shall do well. And that was the only thing that they told them. You don't have to get circumcised. You don't have to follow the books of Moses. You don't have to change your diet. If you like bacon, you're welcome to have bacon. That's fine. And they sent these things and everyone rejoiced. When they read it, when they got to Antioch and all the Gentiles believers read this, they rejoiced because it's like, we are accepted in the beloved. That was like a big thing. And uh, so this changes. So this is the end of like in the book of Acts, this is the end of like the doctrinal dispute part of it. So the case is made for grace. By grace you are saved. Peter makes a big statement. He said, we can't put the Gentiles under a system of legalism that even we could not, have, we, even we struggled with. We couldn't live up to that. And we know that Jesus has given us a salvation that's by grace through faith. And I, seen it, I saw it in action when I went to Cornelius' house. I preached, the Holy Spirit touched them as they believed the words that I was speaking. And that's, you know, this is now, this is an official declaration from the Jerusalem Council that this is, these are the things that you should practice. And we're just telling you because of the nature of the demonic, why did they, speak, why did they specifically pick these three things? Because of the demonic nature of idolatry and paganism. If you can avoid these things, like get away from those things that you used to do, the prostitution that you used to practice at the temple, that any kind of sexual immorality, get away from that. But the strangling and the drinking of blood, get away from that and you'll be fine and just come to Jesus. And they were fine. All right. All right, where do we go from here? Okay, next. All right, so the missionary journey number two, I just have it sort of outlined there just bit by bit. Um, there's like this, I talked about this earlier, there's this disagreement. John Mark is like, he goes on one journey, but he doesn't go on the next one. He gets homesick. And so Paul doesn't want to bring him around anymore. Eventually, John Mark will make good in the ministry. He will write the gospel of Mark. John Mark will become a, you know, he will disappoint Paul, but he will become a strong leader at some point in his life. And, you know, he gets with Peter, and Peter knows about disappointing your mentor. And so Peter brings him along, and basically the Gospel of Mark is Peter telling stories about Jesus to John Mark. And so that's how we have that Gospel. So when we see that in the second missionary journey, maybe I should just show it to you there. Oh, where is it? Sorry. I thought I had the map there right there. But there's, you know, all of these things, we see the different cities that Paul... Paul, you know, Galatia to Troas to Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, these things all start to happen. There's a work in Corinth. He starts, and then this shows sort of Paul's pattern. Uh, Paul's pattern of ministry was to go to a place and seek out the Jewish synagogue first and preach the message of Jesus to them. He's a Jew. He knows the Bible. He understands it. Paul's a Roman citizen. 
uh, you know, he's, he's of Jewish birth, he's of Jewish, from a Jewish family who happens to be a Roman citizen who studied in a Greek university. So he understands everything about the religious practices of the Jews. He understands everything about the governmental and legal system of the Romans, and he understands the philosophies of the day. He's, the world, he's probably the most brilliant man who lived on the planet. He would have been somebody if Jesus, had, Jesus hadn't called him into the ministry. He would have been someone famous and powerful somehow. He was just a brilliant person in that way. And so his pattern here was to go to the synagogue, give them, offer them, preach, talk to them. It was, very, it was a very open system in the synagogue. Any man could, like ste- could step up and express his opinion and read the scriptures and talk about it. So that's what he did. And people were starting to, they're listening to Paul. He was, you know, he was educated, calculated, calculating, and he knew how to present. He was a great apologist for the gospel. And people believed. Uh, but, you know, usually after his people believed, the people who were leading that got jealous and they, you know, they tried to stop his ministry. So, you know, we see that these cities are where Paul, you know, Paul starts to go through there. Uh, the next, next one, Galatia, Phrygia, they meet the man, uh, Apollos, and you can see just the, you know, the different, the different things that happen to him. Um, uh, let's see, he gets a vision of the man of Macedonia, which is Greece, and they come over there to minister there. Uh, there's the riot in Ephesus, great is Diana of the Ephesians, uh, Demetrius and the coppersmith and making little trinkets of, uh, you know, we'll see this when we talk about the book of the Ephesians, little trinkets dedicated to the goddess Diana. And these are like part of the pagan practices that the gospel is starting to uh, counteract men who merchandise these kind of things. So, you know, that's the, uh, you know, that's the, um, you know, that's his missionary journey number three. You see that uh, his third missionary journey goes you know, out and then down to uh, Jerusalem. He crosses over, crosses over from Troas here over into Macedonia, comes back, winds up in Jerusalem. After his third missionary journey, Paul is in Jerusalem and he gets arrested. And this is how the, this is how this, this, the, the last part of the book of Acts is talking about Paul's path to Caesar. He's going to make a presentation to the emperor. He's going to be brought before the emperor to explain the beliefs of Christianity. And many of the household household of Caesar will receive his message. That's the thing. So in Jerusalem, he's caught. He's taken captive. He's put in, uh, you know, there's a plot to to assassinate him. And he's taken to Caesarea. Uh, And, you know, you've read the story. And... um, uh, Paul is then taken on Ro- taken to Rome, and there's a shipwreck. He arrives on they they land on Malta, and then Paul finally arrives in Rome, in um, in chapter 28. He arrives there, and uh, that's uh, you know the, we could where is the uh, let's see here we here we see this is the uh, the route that he took to get there, you know just throughout. This is another way that he got throughout. So Paul had ministered, you know, throughout this part of the world for a while. Then he had ministered in, to, in, Greece, in this part of the world. This is what's now Greece. And now he's going to make it over to the, to the central part of the Roman Empire, which is in Rome. And he's going to be taken there, you know, by Roman centurions. And then here we see the total Roman Empire and, uh, you know, what he... what people that learn from him and talk to him will go up into Gaul, through France, into Britain, over into Spain, and then all along that part of the, the northern part of Africa there. All of that part will be penetrated with the gospel because of the ministry of Paul and how he... So this last, so this last trip takes him through here to Malta, up into Rome, and then you know from there, from his... From his house arrest in Rome, he can influence a lot of people, and people will go out and take the gospel that way. All right, what's next here? All right, the meaning of missions. All right, 
I won't have you get into the group, but what do you think of that, the meaning of missions? What does it mean for us as a ministry? Why is it important that we have a missions mindset based on what we've read tonight and listened to? Pardon me? Spread the gospel. Spread the gospel. Yes. Well, we don't stagnate. Where there is no vision, the people perish. If there is no outflow, there is no inflow, basically. You know, you, have a, you leave a cup of water and you let it sit for a while. If it doesn't get poured out, it's going to get dangerous, really. It's going to multiply microbes and all kinds of things, mosquitoes, all kinds of nasty things can happen. So, you know, the call is the mission's call for today. Yeah, that's good. It's rousing there. Yes, I think you could say that a little bit louder, but I know it's, it's, it's after 8.30 and you're, I understand. And, uh, you know, what should the scope be of our missions work? What do you think about that? What should our scope be? Like we got a world out there, you know, a Muslim world that's, you know, hardly penetrated at this point. What should our scope be about that? Is it, you know, it's interesting. I mean, it's kind of interesting in our ministry, you know, the, one of our first in 75, 76, the ministry, uh, our missions focus was in Finland. People of Finland could go many places behind the communist uh, curtain, and uh, they did. They went there in secret Bible studies, and then when the communism uh, was proven to be what it was, and it all fell apart, then you had all these churches behind the Iron Curtain that were ready to start. And that was, you know, due to the people from Finland and other parts of Europe that could go there. So now we have Pastor Mati uh, Sirvio, who's in Istanbul. It could be possible that in that place there'd be a group of people from all these Middle Eastern countries that would go back into their Muslim areas. And then when that is proven to be what it is, you know, and it will be exposed, it's like it's just a matter of time. Catholic Church was ruthless, it was exposed. Communism, you know, it sort of goes this way. There's a religious system, worldly system. Now we have a religious system that's on the rise, which is the Islamic system. And so this system will be exposed for it is, and then there'll be another worldly system that comes behind it. And that's something that we'll see when we talk about the book of Revelation, just how that happens. Yes? Um, I really like to know the time, um, the time, the, the time frame for the house arrest of Paul, because I noticed that when he was on the house arrest, the gospel reached as far as um, um, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So um, he was in the house arrest. He was in house arrest for two years. He was in house arrest in Rome for two years, receiving, ministering. He had freedom. He had a soldier. He had a soldier assigned to guard him, but he had freedom. So that means he could talk to people. He could receive people. And so uh, I don't know, what, you know whether he had to stay in his house all the time. He could go out, but he, he you know, ministered to a great deal of people. And because that was the uh, governmental center, letters are coming in, letters are going out, people are coming in, people are going out. So the message is traveling based, because, you know, because Paul wound up in this place. God, you know, does, you know, what is it? God is, um, all things work together for good. So Paul's arrest wasn't a great thing but it did work together for good in this case. Okay, so the th thing I want to end with tonight is like these, these great sermons that are in action here before we close. So we see the first, we already went over those pretty powerfully, uh, that, that Peter preached these two to the Jewish audience. And then we also see uh, in Acts 10 when he goes to the Corinthian, uh, to the Cornelius' house, um, he preaches a great sermon to the Gentiles. And, um, but then this one sermon that I want to look at in particular is the book of Acts. You know, Paul, I mean in the book Acts 17. And this is Paul is agitated because he is wandering around Athens and he sees something. It's important. He sees something. He sees this altar that's inscribed with an inscription that says, To the unknown God to the unknown God. Now, the, the, le the story is that years before, there had been like a plague on the city of Athens, and they had sent for someone who knew how to sacrifice to the God of heaven. Now, it wasn't a, a Christian, but he came, 
and they sacrificed to the God of heaven, and, uh, and, the, and the city was healed. And so late years later, the Athenians have forgotten about this message. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Jonah goes to Nineveh, preaches. People get you know, converted, but 150 late years later, the city's back in wickedness, and it's destroyed. And now at Athens, after having someone come and tell them about the God of heaven and having a, a deliverance, they don't really serve him. And so now Paul is wandering around, and he sees this altar that's there to the unknown God because, the, you know, the unknown God. And Paul, you know, preaches this message to them saying, you know, he makes some big statements in this sermon uh, to this, you know, it's a group of philosophers, and they want to hear what he's talking about. And um, he stood up in the midst of them, and he said, I perceive that you are of a very religious people. This is like, you know, if you're talking about the kind of message that we should be sharing today, this might be it, because we're living in an age when, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of who God is is really being silenced in a lot of places. And in Athens, everyone, it says here, the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent all their time doing nothing else but telling or hearing of something new. So any kind of new message, any kind of new philosophy, these guys wanted to hear about it. So Paul speaks about this, and he, the, the sermon goes on like this. He says, uh, Passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, I proclaim him to you. God, who has made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not dwell in the temples that we make with our hands. Neither is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life and breath and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in hopes that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and breathe. So this is a big statement that he's making. Like there's some, in this, in, in the book of Acts, we have another small sermon that tells us like really what should be the breath of it. It tells us one, that God gave everyone life. And it, then it tells us that we are all of one blood. That's like a big thing. You're talking to a, a group of people uh, with a lot of prejudices, I'm sure. Prejudices is, is everywhere. And he's saying, you know, I'm just going to tell you, we're all made of the one blood. God made of one blood every nation. And he put them in their places for certain reasons so that they would seek the Lord. Like, why are certain groups of people are in certain places? God answers that for us. I made every man of the same blood and the same breath, and then I put certain groups of them in certain places. Why did God scatter this group? Why are these people in this place, and why are these people in this place? Why are these people in Far East? Why are these people in Africa? Why? And the answer is right here, so that they should seek the Lord. They are in their place because God's design is that they are there, that they would seek the Lord. And we know that all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. It's a promise from uh, Luke 3, 6. So the reason that God has scattered people the way he has is so that they would seek him. When they were all together at the Tower of Babel, they were building something to reach him, not to seek him. They were trying to be as the Most High. It was a satanic confederation. But this is different. I've separated you, divide and conquer. If I divide you out this way, I can come to you bit by bit and bring the message to you and tear down the walls that are between you and you will find me. So this is the message. You know, when he finally talks about the resurrection, that's when they like, you know, because the Greeks were not interested in retaking your body. When you're dead, you're free. We're all waiting to die so we can be free and our soul can be free from this prison that we're in. And so they dismissed him. But this is like, this is a powerful, some did believe when he talked about, and this is our mess, mission. We know God. We know God. And there's little altars in all kinds of places that say, well, this is like, you know, this, you know, it's like Jesus is unknown. 
in like in the college campuses and other places, Jesus is unknown. And we have the message that makes him known. All right, so there we see Paul speaking to those Greek philosophers. Okay, final part. Okay, where are we? Okay, what do you need to know? The master passion of the church is this. It must be the glory of God. And the inclusive principle of the church is loyalty to the Lord. That means if we are separating away people, if we are turning people away, we aren't loyal to God because he made us of one breath and one blood. And the power of the church is the spirit. It's what we need to know. The next thing is, why do we need to know? Uh, God's purpose is to unveil himself as we love one another. So, This is another important point. Like if we compromise, uh, it covers the beauty of God's holiness and the reality of his justice, the cross. The cross must be at the center of our message. It was at the beginning here, and we saw the effects of it. Peter preached the cross. Thousands were saved a couple of times. We cannot take the cross. So don't compromise the cross in your message. Let's not compromise the cross in our message for the sake of trying to get more people. And only the Spirit can reveal the testimony of Jesus in authority. We can do a lot of things and a lot of, you know, machinery, results-oriented kind of things, but only Jesus reveals, only the Spirit reveals the testimony of Jesus in authority. Okay, what do we need to do? Let, let go of all your prejudices, you know. And this is another thing. Don't, don't try to imitate the incidents in Acts. Like, you know, don't, you know, don't get 120 select people in the upper room and expect that tongues and fire are going to, you know, be above your Bible study. It's like, you know, don't laugh. People have tried that. It's like, you know, it's like it, you know, they look in the book of Acts and they said, we're a book of Acts kind of church. What's that mean? Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, we have, you know, we have, we have sheets come down and there's animal, you know, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, so uh, focus on the essential elements of spirit-led church life. And that's, you know, that's really, you know, speaking, speaking from the Bible, being together that kind of stuff. And then why do we need to do this? The origin of the church came by the Spirit. The nature of the church is energized by the Spirit, and the function of the church can only be guided by the Spirit. All right? Okay. So I think that's, that's it for tonight. Uh, any questions? Yep. Yes. Yes. Were they inspired? What I'm asking is, were they inspired by what took place in Acts, or were they written before Acts? No. You know what I'm asking? Oh, they were written. Um, well, they're probably written at the same time. They probably like the book. Like certain, you know, Paul wrote some of his letters around 50, some in the middle of the 50s, like as, and, he the as he went through them. Yeah. And to address and to address situations and questions that he would get from people. So he wrote to Ephesus based on what they needed. He wrote to the Galatians based on what they needed. He wrote to the Corinthians based on some problems. And yeah, we'll get you'll get a real sense of that in the next class. All right, Lord, we thank you for bringing us together. We pray for all the preparations for the play, all of those people who are in it and a part of it. And however that's happening, we just thank you for our ministry. We just pray for your covering over our churches, Lord, and your, uh, all the churches here represented in this room. Just pray for your ministry there, Lord, your Holy Spirit to lead this time that many would be saved as we preach the cross and celebrate the resurrection. Protect us now as we go, Lord. Give us your great peace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good night.